In this video, we'll go over energy again, energy forms, energy resources, cover that energy principle again, and we will go over centripetal force again as well. Uh, we have a problem today where we have electric charges, uh, and we also have a problem today uh, where we have some sort of uh, circular motion. And so let's get into it. So energy, again, is the ability to basically cause change. It can be measured in different units. It can be transferred or transformed. We have this equivalence between mass and energy with E equals mc squared. The basic types of energy, we have potential due to position or state, and we have kinetic due to motion. Today we'll focus mainly on the gravitational potential energy, so basically mgh, uh, due to being at a certain height relative to another uh, position. And then we have uh, electric potential energy as well, which uh, basically we have this Coulomb's constant, uh, which is 1 over 4 pi uh, epsilon naught. And so we multiply, that's just a constant, and then we multiply the two charges together and we'll divide it by their distance of separation. Notice how it's very similar to Coulomb's law where we have r squared on the bottom, uh, but we do not have the r squared because we're talking about energy not force. And remember, energy also does not have that direction. Uh, and so let's get into the energy forms. Remember, mechanical energy is a lot of times what we're talking about. But today we're talking about electrical as well. So clearly we need to consider the other types. we got sound, thermal, electrical, magnetic, radiant, chemical, nuclear, and so on. Uh, so there's a lot of different ways to classify energy because it is a very big concept, right? And so for energy resources, remember in society, we need renewable and non-renewable energy resources to basically uh, generate the useful energy that we need, which a lot of times is electricity. And so biomass, uh, you know, geothermal, wind, uh, coal, whatever, we need to use these things that we can find in the natural world. Uh, we can gather these uh, energy resources and then convert them uh, to a useful type. We're not creating new energy. We're just um, putting it in a, a useful form. All right, And then we need to be mindful of conserving energy resources because we only have one planet, and uh, we, we need to be mindful of that. Uh, and so uh, energy principle here, again, uh, the main idea is that the energy in the universe is constant. And so when we assume that the energy in the universe is constant, a lot of cool things can happen from there. So we have a system and surroundings. And so the energy of the system is not necessarily constant. Um, so it could be changing. But uh, it, uh, it, it, if it is changing, it's going to be as a result of the surroundings. And so we're going to have work. Uh, basically, uh, which is can be viewed as force times displacement, or we can also integrate. And we also uh, can look at the work kinetic energy theorem, which we have three ways of deriving that, remember. And then we have heat, all right? So that's another way, mechanism of adding or subtracting energy from the system. And so that could be viewed uh, in terms of temperature changes or phase changes. The general idea is that we get to this energy principle, which is trying to account for the changes in energy of our system, uh, it's coming from the mechanisms of heat or work, and we also recognize that uh, the work in is not always equal to the work out, so we don't always have 100% efficiency with machines, like a Carnot engine, for example, is not 100% efficient. Uh, and then we also recognize that a lot of times we don't care about the heat uh, in, in certain problems, so we're looking at just work. And so if that's the case, then we just have changes in energy of our system coming from work. Uh, which is resulting in changes in kinetic and, and potential. Alrighty. So centripetal force, remember, because we do have a centripetal force problem today, uh, we're looking at acceleration and we're looking at velocity and we're looking at a circle. Okay, so we have a center. We can define an initial position and an initial velocity. We can define a final position and a final velocity. We can look at the different angles. Uh, we can say, hey, that angle is going to be 30 degrees there. Uh, we can also say this angle up here is going to be 30 degrees, or negative 30 uh, here. Um, and so we basically get the, the, the same angle here as 30. And so we can produce these like similar triangles. Um, and we have like these isosceles triangles. We have the same speed, same radius. 
uh, isosceles triangles, you set up a proportion here. Um, the ratio of the bases equals the ratio of the sides. And it, the basic idea is that we can derive then what it would be like to have an acceleration only coming from changes in direction, not coming from changes in speed. And so when we do that, we look at this proportion, uh, we uh, can divide both sides by delta t. Uh, we recognize that one of them is acceleration here and one of them is velocity. And then we, you know, solve and we get the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. And so it's this new type of net force, really. Um, it's basically telling you what you need. And so we have the centripetal force uh, is mass times the centripetal acceleration. Notice how that's similar to F naught equals MA because it is kind of like a new net force, right? Uh, which is MV squared over R because we just said that AC is V squared over R. And so we have what you need and a lot of times we're setting that equal to what supplies it, which is a, which is an actual force, right? So a net force is not an actual force. It's just a, a sum of what is supplying it, right? And so we have tension, friction, normal uh, force or gravity that could be supplying the, the what you need to be able to move a mass at a particular velocity uh, at a particular radius in a, in a circle. And we also recognize that we could have uniform circular motion or non-uniform circular motion. Uh, in which we have, you know, constant speed or changing speed, but both of both of them have centripetal acceleration, uh, and uh, so that's what centripetal force is all about. So now let's get into a problem here. We have three protons. Remember, protons are basically subatomic particles. They're part of uh, the nucleus, right? So every element on the periodic table. Uh, we can have atoms of those elements, and then uh, we have a nucleus uh, to that atom, and the nucleus is composed of protons and, and neutrons, and so protons are positively charged. Um, how many protons are in the nucleus determine the atomic number, uh, which is the element number basically on the, on the periodic table. And these protons have certain masses to them uh, and uh, a certain charge, right, positive charge, Actually, just one proton is basically a hydrogen nucleus. Uh, and so hydrogen is the first element on the periodic table. And so uh, it just has one proton, uh, and, and that's it, and one electron if it's neutral. But uh, let's just say that there's one proton, uh, and it is exposed to another two protons, so three total here. And they're initially held at the corners of equilateral an equilateral triangle, right? And so we have a lot of symmetry going on in this problem, so we're, we're probably going to have some simplifications happening, but the general idea here is, is going to be uh, an important one. And so the question is, what is the kinetic energy of each proton when the protons are very far apart? And so we can ask ourselves, okay, well, they're initially held there, uh, and they're released from rest, so we don't really have any kinetic energy to start with because um, we have no speed, right? And then once they're really, really, really far away, uh, so we start with some potential, right? Because they have potential relative to each other, um, and there's no kinetic. But once they're really, really far away, we can pretty much view uh, the potential as nothing. The potential is being transformed into kinetic as we move farther away. And so we have a three-particle system that we could use to solve this problem. Uh, we could also use a one-particle system. I'll show you both. The three-particle system is a little bit easier to think about. And so if we do view this as a three-particle system, uh, one of the reasons why we do that is so we basically can say that the surroundings is nothing significant. And that means that uh, I have my energy of my system, uh, and if it's changing, it's going to be coming from heat or work. We're not really going to consider heat and so it's going to be coming from work and so in this case I'm just going to say it's zero because there's no work from the surroundings because the surroundings is insignificant based on the way I set this system up so I'm going to use a three particle system and so that means that any changes in kinetic energy is going to be the negative change in uh, potential energy and the other way to think about this is that whatever my initial system energy is has to be equal to my final system energy because there was no change, right? So that's, I think, maybe a more useful way to think about it because then what you can do is say, okay, well, what do I have initially in my system? Well, kinetic and potential, but wait a second, we don't have any kinetic initially and we don't have any potential at the end. 
Uh, and so now we basically can say, okay, well, my potential energy of my system initially can be set equal to the kinetic energy of my system at the end. And I can break that down even further. I can say, okay, well, what is the potential energy of my system initially? Well, it's coming from uh, the, um, there's three charges, right? So it's coming from the potential energy, let's say, between one and two, uh, the potential energy between one and three, and also the potential energy between two and three. And so I have three different potential energy functions that kind of describe the potential energy going on there initially. And then I also have three different kinetic energy uh, functions for, for each particle as well, because there's three different particles. Each of them are going to have some kinetic energy at the end. The cool thing is um, because we have some symmetry here, so uh, when, we, when we break this up, we recognize that we would have to, you know, use these different formulas uh, with, the, with the different numbers, but we recognize that uh, we don't have to use the different numbers because the distances are all the same. They're just d. Uh, the charges are all the same. They're just E, positive E. Uh, and we also know that the, the masses are, are the same, right, uh, because they're all protons. So there, there's a lot of symmetry that happens here. And so what we can then do is just kind of simplify it down and, uh, and just say that they're basically all the same uh, potential energies uh, and all the same kinetic energy, so we just multiply them by 3. And uh, what we get there then is that the 3s are going to cancel and we have basically the kinetic energy here of one particle uh, is equal to uh, the 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. This is basically just the Coulomb's constant times uh, e squared over d, uh, which is your 1 half mv squared. If you want to go further and solve for v, you could. Uh, and then you get an expression for the velocity as well. So that's how you would do it as a three-particle system. Uh, to get the kinetic energy of one particle, which is what they are asking for, the kinetic energy of each proton. So the other way to do it, though, uh, which was, a, it's a little bit more tricky to think about maybe, uh, but we can think about just one particle as our system. And if we do that, then our surroundings is no longer insignificant. And so we have two other protons, all right? And so we have the change in energy of our system. This is our energy principle. We're not really going to consider heat. We're going to consider work. We are saying, okay, it's not equal to zero this time. There is going to be some change in energy of my system uh, because there there is uh, work coming from my surroundings. And so we need to actually account for that work now. And so what we can do is say, okay, well, this uh, proton here, um, we're basically saying that they're all positive, right? And we know that like charges uh, uh, repel and opposites attract. And so this one uh, is going to exert a force up and to the right. You can think about it as a part of it is here pushing to the right, and a part of it is, is here pushing up. And so we have uh, this triangle that we can kind of set up here, and, and the one that we're going to care about is the F cosine of 30 degrees, uh, which is the component acting up. And the reason why is because we have the other one uh, coming from the other side here, and it's like it's like it's pushing the other way, and so uh, the x components, if you will, are basically going to cancel out. They're equal and opposite, but we actually have a doubling here of the f cosine of uh, of 30 uh, component of these forces that are acting, and so that gives you a net force of 2 f cosine 30 uh, is acting on your system from these other two particles. So there's some force information for you. The other thing to consider is that. Uh, we have interesting things happening with these distances here. Uh, and so we could define this L uh, to be D cosine 30. Uh, and L is not necessarily the same thing as D, uh, but it does kind of matter in the way that we set this problem up. And so if you think about it, uh, what's happening here is uh, I have this dr uh, of separation. Uh, so if I have some changes, when when this is moving this way and that's moving that way, it's going to result in some sort of a dr uh, or, or small change in in, uh, in distance of, of separation, right? And so this is going to be dr over 2, and then the other dr over 2 is going to come from the other side. And so overall, it's going to be some sort of a dr. And so what I really kind of want to do is write that in terms of dl. And so uh, I can have an expression of dl uh, and, and, and dr and relate them together using this triangle here, and I get uh, cosine of 30 degrees is dr over 2 over dl, and so I have a new expression for dl here, which is dr over 
2 cosine of 30. And so this is really going to help me with my calculus here because it's definitely a variable force, right? So as they become farther away, the force is getting less and less. And so I need to integrate. And so looking at the work done by the surroundings, I'm going to be integrating uh, here. And the force that we're considering uh, is the coming from Coulomb's law. And basically what I want to do is say, okay, well, the work done from the surroundings is going to be the integral from this initial L to the final L. Uh, and uh, F nat cosine of zero degrees, because uh, in this case uh, it would be uh, in the same direction, uh, the, the force here, it would be in the same direction of, of the movement uh, times DL. Um, but, I, but I need to integrate uh, with respect to a different variable. Uh, and so we're going to change our bounds, we're going to change uh, DL into the DR over two cosine theta. And what that does is it eliminates that cosine 30 and it also eliminates the 2 as well. Uh, and, and remember that that 2 being eliminated kind of comes from the idea that you have some distance being moved here and being moved here. And so it results in that dr over 2 and then the dr over 2 there. But anyway, you, you get the 2's cancel, the cosine 30's cancel, and we're left with this new integral here where we can integrate. Uh, we, can, we can integrate our force here and we end up uh, with uh, zero uh, at I the infinity, so uh, f of b minus f of a. So at an infinite distance, uh, we're not going to have anything going on. Um, and then minus, and then we got our negative here from, from integrating, because uh, we're integrating with respect to r, and uh, we're going to get a negative there when we integrate. Uh, but it becomes positive because it cancels there. And so we end up with basically what we got before from the work done by the surroundings. And so we have our network is the internal work, which we're not considering, plus the work done from the surroundings, which is our change in kinetic energy. This is our work kinetic energy theorem. And we don't have any kinetic energy initially, so we're basically setting this equal to our final kinetic energy of our, of our particle here, our system. And so we can basically say then that the work done from the surroundings is equal to that final kinetic energy, right? And, uh, and so the kinetic energy of our particle, same as what we had before. It's just a different way to think about it. As you can see, it, it, it's a little bit trickier to think about it in terms of forces with all the angles and trying to get the math to work out to give you the same answer. And so the three-particle system is definitely preferable for this problem, I would say. Alrighty, so the, the last problem here, we're looking at a... Uh, an ice block uh, here at position one. It's at rest initially, and we're coming down into uh, the, the bottom here at position two. And we have some sort of a, a height here, and we can kind of just treat that as our reference height relative to the bottom, which would be zero. Uh, we have some sort of a radius to this circle here, and our goal is to find the block's speed at location two. Uh, and so it, it's going to be gaining some kinetic energy, gaining some speed as it falls down. And so that's our part one here. And so what we can do is say, okay, well, the change in energy of our system is coming from Q plus W. That's our energy principle. We're mainly considering the work done from the surroundings. And that's going to be zero. Uh, we're basically going to assume since it's a smooth track, there's no friction. Uh, really, there's no work done from the surroundings uh, based on how we can define our our, our system and so there's no change in energy of our system and therefore the change in kinetic energy is going to be equal to the negative change in potential energy uh, the other way to think about it that is uh, whatever energy you had initially is going to be equal to whatever energy you have finally as, as long as there's no energy change right and so whatever your energy of your system is got to be the same it, it didn't get created or destroyed and so as long as it didn't go to the surroundings it's going to be the same and so we have uh, this idea where, okay, well, what is the initial energy of my system? It's going to be kinetic plus potential. I don't start with any kinetic because I'm at rest. And kinetic plus potential for final, I don't have any potential in the final position because I'm going to assume that that's a height of zero. And so we can basically set uh, the potential energy at the top equal to the kinetic energy at the bottom, which is a very common result in physics that, that we like to do. And so we end up getting mgh initially, uh, where h initially is just r in this case. It's just the radius. Um, 
and equal to one half mvf squared. And so the uh, the initial potential is equal to the final kinetic. We can solve for uh, vf, and when we do that, we multiply by two, we square root, and we get the the final velocity there at the bottom is the square root of two gr. Uh, and so that's for part one. We're going to find that speed at location two, so that's it. And then it, for part two, we have two different parts here. We want to find the net force acting on the block when it's at location two, and then we want to find the force uh, by the track on the block, so basically the normal force. And so for this one, we're going to look at centripetal force. So that's why we talked about that earlier. Uh, we know that centripetal force is the mass times the centripetal acceleration, which is uh, mass times uh, v squared over r. And that is what you need. And then what supplies it in this case is going to be uh, normal force, which is acting up, and then gravitational force acting uh, down. And so the, the sum of those two, that, that net force, is what's supplying uh, your, your, uh, your, what you need there. Okay, so we can figure out what we need based on the mass, based on the velocity, based on the radius, and then we we know that some real forces actually have to be supplying that. And so we have uh, mv squared over r, which is what you need, and then what's supplying it? We have fn uh, acting up, and we have fg acting down. So we'll deal with the magnitudes. And we can plug in for our V, because we know the V there is going to be our final velocity that we calculated before. So we'll plug in our square root of 2GR, but we're going to square it. So that square root, just get you get rid of that. The R's cancel. And uh, the other thing you can do is re recognize that uh, FG is just MG. And so you end up with uh, 2MG is equal to FN minus MG. And so this is what you need, and this is what's supplying it. And so we end up basically with our answer for part A now because we got the net force acting on the block. Uh, so we got our FC or F naught, right? And so that's just going to be 2mg uh, in that uh, upwards y direction. And so now we can go one step further, though, and solve for part B. They want to know what the force is by the track on the block. So that's going to be solving for Fn, basically. And we're just going to add the mg over to the other side. And we get 3 mg, and so our normal force, the force of the track on the block at the bottom there, is going to be 3 mg. So we have 3 mg up, and then we have mg down uh, with a net of 2 mg up. And so um, that is this problem too, and it shows you how we can uh, use energy uh, to uh, get to an answer for velocity, and then use that velocity for something else. So. Again, we see two problems here, one with electrical charges, one with more of a mechanical situation with centripetal force, and both of which we used the energy principle, and hopefully this energy principle is starting to make a little bit more sense now. So we will see you in the next one.